You are listening to the Gospel Music Explosion with Minister Robin Lynn.
All right, good morning, good morning. You've got Minister A Minute with Minister Maven. That's me, Minister Robin Lynn. We're going to get right into it. We are, uh, we are on a journey of understanding the Holy Spirit. I will be here every day teaching on understanding the Holy Spirit. Let us go uh, build boldly before the throne of grace and mercy. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we are so glad, glad, glad. You said enter your courts with thanksgiving and with praise. So here we are singing your praises all day long. Father God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us into all truth. All wisdom comes from above. I pray that we all pick up what you're putting down. I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And our scripture today, oh Lord, is coming from, oh Jesus, I done lost it again. I always do this. Jesus Christ, Lord help me. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, here we go. It's coming from Psalms 140 verses, verses 12 and 13, which says, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Hallelujah. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the doing of his word. All right. So today we're going to be trying to look at some everyday questions and answers about the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Now, I, as a minister, I've been asked many questions concerning the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, and uh, it, there's, it, that lets me know that there's a lot of people out there with unanswered questions on the Holy Spirit. Okay. And uh, in... In learning more about the Holy Spirit, um, I realized that uh, I can't gain understanding of the Holy Spirit by by based on what I've heard or even what I thought. Okay, I had to I had to go to the Bible and see what the Bible actually said. All right, all right, and if the Bible. Um, was quiet on a particular subject, meaning it didn't say. Okay, we could we can't insert our own opinion. Father says, "Lean not to thine own understanding." Okay, so all the answers uh, that that we're looking, okay, uh, uh, that we're that I'm that we'll be going through, they're all coming from the Bible. They're all ba biblically based with scripture references. All right, so here we go. One question that 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 that's asked is, when do you receive the Holy Spirit? When do you receive the Holy Spirit? Now, this question assumes that there are two separate events that happen in the life of a Christian. One is that he or she gets saved, and the other is that he or she receives the Holy Spirit. But are these two separate events really supported by the Word of God? Ephesians 1 and 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This passage would indicate that at the moment one believes in Christ, becomes saved, he becomes sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you look at the same passage in the New Living Translation, it makes this point even clearer. And now you must also have heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised you long ago. At the very moment of accepting Christ, he accepts us as his own and identifies us or seals us as his through the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, there are several scriptures that indicate that we must have the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. 
Romans 8 and 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now look at this same verse uh, over in the contemporary version. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them are not Christians at all. Now, this is not my opinion. This is a passage in the Holy Bible that clearly states that if we do not have the Holy Spirit, we do not belong to Christ. An individual may still be a babe in Christ not demonstrating the life of a mature Christian, but in order to accept Christ, they had to have had the Holy Spirit. Okay? Amen. Revelations 3 and 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The picture painted here by Christ himself is that the Holy Spirit comes to live in us when we open up the doors of our heart. The moment we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. There is no waiting period, no begging period, no tearing, tearing, tarry, no tearing period. A person receives the Holy Spirit from the very moment they accept Christ and believe in Him, according to Romans 10 and 9. If, for if you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you received the whole, and this is another question, here we go. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now this is, this is, this question is one that comes from the Holy Bible directly. On the surface of things, it would indicate that a person could believe and not have the Holy Spirit. He said unto them, He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Thus, many have taken this passage to mean that we could be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. However, the reality is, that the people referred to in this passage were not truly saved. Acts 19 and 3 says, And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto, and they said, Unto John's baptism. These men were John the Baptist's disciples who had not come into the knowledge of Christ. They couldn't have been saved because Christ is the only way to God. Jesus is the only name whereby men may be saved. The moment you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, seal you, and baptize you in the body of believers, into the body of believers. Paul recognized this. Paul recognized that this had not happened to these people and thus explained to them what it meant to be saved. Okay? Uh, uh, in the next verses, Acts 19, 4-5, Then Paul, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Once they accepted the message of Jesus Christ, they became saved and received the Holy Spirit. Acts 19, 6 and 7, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake in tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. Now please note that once they accepted Jesus Christ, they received the Holy Spirit. The reason these men did not have the Holy Spirit before was not because they needed to tarry or wait for him. It was because they had not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Another question is, do you lose the Holy Spirit when you sin? Now this is a very powerful question. And it boils down to what happens 
when we sin? The incorrect answer to this question is responsible for a lot of people not being saved or even in the church today. Okay, uh, a, a, way, a good way to answer, I believe, is to first look at how we receive the Holy Spirit. If you recall, when we receive the Holy Spirit at, at, if you recall, we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment that we accept Christ according to Ephesians 1 and 13 and Revelations 3 and 20. Let's look at both of these scriptures again. Galatians 1 and 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What I want you to notice in looking at these scriptures is that there is no mention of sin. In other words, the Holy Bible never says for us to give up sin in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here concerning sin. I'm not an advocate. I am not an advocate of once saved, always saved doctrine. Okay, as a matter of fact, God clearly does not want us to sin. He hates all sin. Okay. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? We were saved, not because we stopped sinning, but because of God's grace. We were justified in the sight of God through the death of Jesus on the cross, and thus received the gift of salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Our lack of sinning did not save us and cannot save us. As a matter of fact, God says that any righteousness that we could muster up would still be as filthy rags to him anyway. Okay? That's in Isaiah 64 and 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Mm-hmm. A gift is something that one receives free of charge. If we had to work for the Holy Spirit, then it would no longer be a gift. If I tell you that I'm going to give you a gift of $100, but then ask you first to clean my house before I give it to you, then the $100 is no longer a gift, but a wage for services rendered. We do not earn the, the Holy Spirit because He is not a wage. He is a gift. As a matter of fact, there is not enough we could ever do to earn the Holy Spirit. So God gave us the Holy Spirit as a gift. The Holy Spirit did not come to us because we stopped sinning. He came to us because we accepted, the, accepted God's gift of salvation. Jeremiah 3 and 14 says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. The Holy Spirit lives in us so he can lead us, guide us, and teach us all things. A teacher is there to teach you, not just when you do things right, but also when you make mistakes. If the Holy Spirit left us every time we sinned, how could he ever teach us? Now, here is what is supposed to happen when we sin. 1 John 2 one and first John chapter 2 verses 1 and 12 my dear children I am writing this to you so that you will not sin but if you do sin there is someone to plead for you before the father he is Jesus Christ the one who pleases God completely he is the sacrifice for our sins he takes away not only our sins but the sins of all the world sin does not forfeit us from the Holy Spirit no more than a child is forfeited from his family when he misbehaves but when that child is bad he simply says to his parents I'm sorry and so it is with us Christians if we sin we simply say to father I'm sorry and he forgives us next question what does it mean 
to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? When does a, a person receive... Uh, okay, and, and uh, we just discussed uh, when a person receives the Holy Spirit. And we learned that the Holy Spirit enters our heart when we be, accept Jesus Christ. Okay? As a matter of fact, according to Romans 8, we do not belong to Christ unless we have the Holy Spirit. But this question deals with the filling of the Holy Spirit. I believe that a, that a person can have the Holy Spirit and not yet be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means to be totally controlled by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 and 18 be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The New Living Translation actually uses the word control when referring to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians uh, uh, says, Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. Now, this passage in the Bible uses a metaphor to describe what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It first says to be not drunk with wine. When a person is drunk with wine, the wine controls them. They begin to do things that they would not ordinarily do. A quiet and reserved person all of a sudden becomes the life of the party or very rowdy. The wine is now controlling their behavior. So what the scripture is saying is that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, He will control your behavior. You will, do, you will begin to do things that you would not ordinarily have done. For example, Jesus said that we should love our enemies. Well, most people, saved or unsaved, are incapable of doing this. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you can. Now, if you recognize being filled with the Holy Spirit as being controlled by the Holy Spirit, it would explain why the behavior of some Christians differ from that of others. The Holy Bible supports this concept and calls it being a babe in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 3 says, 1 through 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye now able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions called haters, and ye are, are, and ye are not carnal, and walk as men. Are ye not carnal? Okay. Now look at the third verse in the New Living Transition. If you are still controlled by your own sinful nature, you are jealous. Okay, if you are still controlled by your own sinful desires, for you are still controlled by your own sinful desires, you are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your own desires? You are acting like people who don't belong to the Lord. Now please note that a babe in Christ is not necessarily a person that just got saved. It is a person who is not being controlled by the Spirit, but by their sinful fleshly desires. When we, we move from being a babe in Christ to being a mature Christian, when the Holy Spirit is controlling us. But also, please note that a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit can move back into being a babe in Christ if they allow their sinful nature to move back into the control of their lives. This is why I say that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-time even signified event signified by speaking in tongues or some other outward event, but by the ongoing demonstration of a lifestyle controlled by the Spirit. And just as a car must constantly go and get filled with gas, we must do the things necessary to constantly get filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to wrap that up for, for today, and we'll come back tomorrow uh, uh pick up right where we left off. Uh, uh, I pray that, you, that we are all enlightened, empowered, and blessed. Stay strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 
that is my prayer all right and we will see everyone tomorrow god bless you has something bad to say about you, what do you do? this is what I want you to when tell me. Them flights. How many times I'm gonna watch my life for selling that white, for selling the green? They lost everything, including my team. Money still wanted, pocket still not it. Seems like only thing ever changed is the weather. Still selling music out the trunk, whatever. Can't shake a G spot light under pressure. Still that terror on the young east side. Calling on foes, that's how we ride. Pick up a Simmons Coast at peace side. I'm the main event, just living my life. Still got kids, still got bills, and it's so thin, I can't really live. My head to the sky, praying to the Lord. Ben got a plan, gotta hop on board. Stay old school with it, phone stay jumping. Street legends spit my flows, keep coming like a never. Stop and want to flow and people hit you go and never know what it is to live like this And niggas want to call me green as fuck But I don't give a fuck, I'm taking y'all on my list West means you gotta maintain this purpose I'm the only one left in my family with you
it's gone. Oh. Like juice in a gene. Let me drink. Success blows up like going with the wind. Oh God, never give up. Like Rocky said, ding, ding. I stick and move, bob and weave, sides in my head. Let's go. People just don't know how to be a winner. Burr. They take the wrong path and become a sinner. Here we go. Shit just opened up my eyes. Just I but true. Trumpet mama. For the young kids, blacks and young youth. My boys. Faith is the only way that we trust in. What? Heart like a boxer, we going we in. The cartels. All I know to do is to be a winner. What? Success is served like a steak what dinner. When you were a little kid and you thought about what you wanted to be, teaching was at the top of your list. But things changed. And as you got older, teaching didn't seem like the best option anymore. So you're thinking you'll be something else. But what would your 12-year-old self say? Now you want to be a doctor. You don't think teachers save lives? 25 at a time. An actress? Try playing a different role every time the bell rings. How about a scientist? Ever heard of physics? Chemistry? Who do you think teaches that? Teachers today are breaking down obstacles, finding innovative ways to instill old lessons, and taking learning far beyond the four walls of the classroom. It's time to recognize that great things are happening in teaching and put it back on your list. Don't try to convince yourself otherwise. You had it right the first time. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This message is for all of you sitting in the passenger seat. And apologies if it gets a little uncomfortable. But how does it feel to be at the mercy of someone who thinks a random text is more important than your life? Someone who takes their eyes off the road while speeding along in a three-ton hunk of steel. Freaky, right? Well, why not just ask them to stop? Or better yet, volunteer to text for them. It might be a little awkward, but believe me, you'll live. Learn more at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Welcome Safety Welcome back to the Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. We're continuing our conversation with James Henry. James Henry now joins us from New York. He is a leading economist, attorney, and investigative journalist who has written extensively about global issues. Thanks for joining us again, James. You're very welcome. So, James, let's pick up our conversation where we left it off. We were discussing Swiss banks in relation to the tax dodging uh, tax havens across the world. So it sounds like to me this is sort of this endless game of cat and mouse between the elite and the government. What enforcement regulations could be put in place to change this status quo? Um, and, And let's take it from the Greek government's perspective. What could they actually put in place to regulate uh, taxes? I think the situation highlights the fact that it's very little that Greece can do on its own uh, to tax, uh, to raise taxes on those who are most able to pay the taxes, uh, because they have uh, the mobility of capital. I mean, they can move their registrations to other locations, their corporations offshore, um, you know, and they've already threatened to do that. The latest bailout package that was passed at 4 a.m. Uh, our time last, or Greek time last uh, night, was. Um, you know, one of the provisions included there was this increased duty uh, uh, on the uh, tonnage rate, which is uh, a portion to the uh, size of each ship. And Greek ship owners have all already threatened that they would be relocating their ships uh, elsewhere beyond the reach of the Greek uh, tax increase here. So, uh, you know, in order to uh, to be able to levy taxes on the wealthy, Greece needs to uh, to have help of the international community, uh, not only the EU, but also entities like Switzerland that have hosted uh, 
Greek foreign assets for generations. Uh, and uh, this highlights the fact that Greece uh, is not uh, able to solve this crisis on its own, uh, despite the, the fact that the brutalitarian package that it's now adopted of uh, reform measures, uh, you know, basically requires it to make a lot of changes and the EU and other countries, you know, to go on with business as usual. Uh, I think uh, this is a case for, you know, I mean, the sh world shipping industry is a great example of an industry that's largely off the books. Um, you know, its owners aren't paying taxes. The ships are underregulated. Mm -hmm. uh, Greece is, you know, left to its own devices to try to raise taxes. It's not going to work. Would it work better if Greece were to be outside of the Eurozone or would they, would it still be the same sort of dynamic? No, I think if Greece were outside the Eurozone, that wouldn't really address this fundamental uh, tax problem. It might make it worse. I mean, being within the Eurozone, it should be able to argue, you know, for equitable uh, uh, treatment. And one of the equitable, equitable benefits, supposedly, of being members of the EU and being a member of the Eurozone is to be uh, assisted with uh, tax collection. And, you know, we're not talking about raising taxes uh, uh so much as we are on, uh, you know, talking about being able to effectively collect taxes. Most of the attention that the IMF and the ECB and the EU members of the Troika have given is to raise, raising taxes on ordinary Greek citizens. Uh, they have increased the VAT tax from 13% to 23%. This is a virtually unavoidable sales tax. Um, but uh, at the higher levels, of uh, society, they haven't developed a program for helping uh, Greece collect more taxes, and that's what we need to do here. But James, some could, would argue that essentially the system isn't created for us to be able to collect taxes on the elite, and if you're going to depend on the international community, uh, the Troika, they, they essentially are in the interest of private industry, banks, and they're not interested in collecting taxes and, and aren't going to create those mechanisms. What would you say to that? Well, this is uh, an example of where we've had decades of so-called tax competition among you know, all the members of the EU, the United States as well, and Canada and the world community at large. Uh, Corporate tax rates and the increased use of offshore havens uh, has accelerated throughout the last 30, 40 years to the point where it's become very hard to have any kind of uh, fair income taxation. Uh, you know, we're, we're, this is a fundamental issue. If we're going to uh, uh, help countries like Greece have a more equitable society, uh, we, uh, we basically have to clean up the world system as well as Greece. Um, otherwise, we're going to have the, the cost of this entire crisis being borne by the, the middle class and the poor in Greece, and that's what's been happening so far. What about this issue that this is essentially all part of the plan, that these these um, Greek elite families are just sort of waiting for these islands and public assets to eventually be privatized and, and be able to profit largely um, in what some people anticipate as being a fire sale of these assets in the future? What do you make of that? Yeah, the latest bailout calls for uh, 50 billion euros of privatization. Uh, about half of that would be state banks, but there are valuable assets like uh, one of the largest ports in the world. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, is a, is a very valuable state asset that would be on the block. Um, you know, this is a pattern in other privatizations around the world where we've seen the same kind of austerity programs uh, imposed. The elite move their money offshore to secure currencies, and then when the privatization deals happen. They were the ones to come in and uh, uh, be able to buy up the assets at fire sale prices. Uh, you know, Greek owners are probably salivating at some of the assets that are being going to be offered here, but they're going to have to compete with people like the Chinese. So, uh, but it, it is unseemly if you know the, the history of this industry, the Greek shipping industry in particular, but also other uh, industries like tourism, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, a lot of which was. Uh, parked in offshore havens um, or arranges its sales so that the sales are booked in Switzerland and Zug rather than in uh, the manufacturing facilities where they're, they're actually uh, making the products in Greece. You know that the offshore industry here is basically uh, 
you know, a big contributor to this kind of financial mess. And it shouldn't be allowed to escape uh, scot-free. And it shouldn't be allowed to go now and buy up these privatized state assets at the fire sale prices. All right, James Henry, thank you so much for your commentary. Quite welcome. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Message from Starbright Entertainment. Hey, this is Damon Carter, Starbright Entertainment, Starbright Music South. Calling in the Vibes Live saying, happy one million viewers, happy one million listeners, happy global, internationally known Vibes Live. Shouts out to Ms. Robin Lynn. Hey. You're doing it big over there, sister girl. Do your thing. Make it do what it do. All right? Signing off. One million listeners. Peace. Play his guitar